I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be amongst educators and people who care for the education and liberation of young people. Um, my name is Janata. I have a slideshow to show a little bit about kind of the work that brought me to the space of writing, um, the book that I wrote, um, The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, um, which is a love story to Minneapolis, to queerness, to the black diaspora that I'm from, um, and all of the ways it shaped me spiritually, emotionally, and the ways that I thought it was critical to impart a lot of my journey not only as an artist and a thinker, but also as a seeker of context of who I am as a black person, as a queer person, in a society that has largely invisibilized my existence. So I think, um, yeah, I'm gonna just go through some of the work that I did beforehand, which in a lot of my early years began as a youth worker, as an educator. Um, and I'm so grateful to all of the ways that those experiences got to really ground me in the souls of young folks and the sense of wonder and magic and limitlessness that they bring to life. And as people who interact and engage young people, like how do we protect that? How do we allow um, the insights and the wisdom almost ancestrally that young people iner inherently hold um, and protect it and learn from it. Um, so yeah, let me just go through some stuff with ya. So I'm a writer, I'm a playwright, filmmaker, pleasure activist, multi-dimensional performance artist, runaway witch, occasional black aerialist, cosmic bag lady, and an all around hustler. Um, so this is me when I was little. Um, I wanted to just kind of center in, I think, amongst us all and including me, like carry around a young person that very much had people listen to them in good ways and maybe not so good ways. Um, I think so much of writing my book was sitting with my young self. Um, oh, the pictures aren't showing up in here, which is okay. It's all right. For some reason, the pictures aren't showing except that first one. Do you know what's going on with that? Okay, that's fine. We'll just take it. It's not that important anyways, PowerPoint, whatever. Um, but yeah, so a lot of the work I've done um, leading into being an, um, a writer and kind of focusing more of my work as an author um, was in doing circus arts, aerial arts, um, and also doing puppetry and doing big parades like the Heart of the Beast um, May Day Parade and um, writing theatrical works, specifically theatrical works that included themes of the prison industrial complex, um, mother-daughter relationships, the ways that familial and ancestral trauma becomes a part of our journey and figuring out ourselves and our healing and um, yeah, just kind of discerning our paths for ourselves. So I think when I was moving into the space of working on this book, um, I really felt like I could collect all of these things, like the, the aspects of sort of magic and limitlessness that I think has really supported me and my existence as a creative and grounding it in this book. Um, so I would like to just have y'all ponder for a moment. Um, what were some of the first times you remember getting like tingly, wingly feelings for somebody as an adolescent? And if you need to kind of close your eyes and get internal and just think about some of those early feelings of being like, ooh, that person's cute, or does this person think I'm cute? Or my friend who I'm so intensely into, like what's this intense connection, you know? And just kind of ground there for a moment because that's where I'll be taking us today. So I also want you to think about also as you developed, what were some of the spaces when you really started to contemplate pleasure and desire and figuring out um, what made your little heart tingle, you know, especially in that space of adolescence and teen life? And I know there are some teens in here recently, so maybe it's been more recent for y'all since y'all like 17 or something, but um, just for us adults to go into that space. Um, I also want you to think of 
who are the people who you could talk to, who could be your sort of representation, if there was somebody like that, someone you felt you could talk to, and if not, what it felt like to not have somebody reliable. Um, so in pondering that, um, I think that was, in writing this book, a huge jumping off place for me. Um, the story is about two girls, um, one from Trinidad, um, where my mother is from, um, which is an island in the Caribbean, and one from Minneapolis, who come into each other's life when the girl from Trinidad gets sent up to Minneapolis to live with her uh, black American father after she's discovered with her secret girlfriend. Um, and she befriends this girl up here in Minneapolis who's a quirky, basketball-loving, Whitney Houston-obsessed teenager who's really reflective on like, okay, what am I about? What inspires me? And they, in their sort of teen girl existentiality, um, start to connect and um, find out that the girl who's based in Minneapolis, Mabel, has a very serious illness. Um, and in navigating this space of healing and existentiality and life and death, um, the girl Mabel finds a memoir written by a man called Afua. And the book is called The Stars and the Blackness Between Them. And he's a man on death row, and he's an astrologer. And um, the girls, as they're kind of figuring out this moment of love and connecting, also start thinking about huger realities around black life and ancestors and healing from the earth and the land. Uh, so in my path to coming to this book, which I will read y'all a piece of soon, um, so hopefully that's you know salivating in your mouth and making it all yummy and anticipatory. Um, but in moving into the space of this work is I started um, with the idea of this book when I literally, I was just like taking a shower randomly, which is where a lot of my ideas happen. It's like, I'm just minding my own business, taking a shower. And then I'm like, oh my God, like a story will come or an image will come. And the idea that came to my mind was that a kid who has this like, mysterious death possible illness um, intersects with a person who's on death row and they're both black. Um, and something about this like eminence sort of death sentence brings them together. Um, and through working on this storyline and thinking about this initially as a movie, as a screenplay, um, it slowly became a love story and it slowly really became to blossom around like how um, queer love has always existed um, and how it's existed within the lineage that I'm from as a Caribbean woman, as an African woman. Uh, and there's ways that I get to imagine it into the past in the process of this book. Uh, I had an opportunity also with this book to think about what ways am I as a person who's first generation, um, as a person who's one of the few out queer people in my family, how do I get to imagine a history and a lineage of myself that doesn't erase or colonize away some of the stories of my ancestors that certainly I imagine some one or two or three ancestors was gay. Um, and also like how do we, in a history that wants to erase anything that doesn't fit into a cis heteronormative realm, like how do I as a writer feel brave and bold and write these stories, which um, as a young person, I so very much wanted to have. I so wanted to know how romance would work on my little black girl body. Um, how would I know, yeah, how to pursue somebody I'm interested in. Um, I love to read as a young person and read a ton of like salacious books like V.C. Andrews. I don't know why my mom let me do that. Um, Anne Rice, like vampires. I was like, oh, these vampires are hot doing things. Um, so like there was a part of me that very much was hungry for these conversations that weren't being given to me. Um, so like in writing the book, I was like, all right, how do I give these black girls not only a sense of like, ooh, they're curious about love, but give them a sense of, you know, like there's making out that happens. There's 
female masturbation that happens, which I think is important to tell the young people about, um, and letting them know that they have access to their body and ownership of their body and um, protection and power over their bodies in ways that they not only deserve, but that they might also actually educate the next generation about. Are y'all with me so far? Okay, cool, because I feel like I'm with y'all, but my, this thing wasn't here, so I'm like, okay, this is a new vibe now, but as long as y'all are with me, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, let's see what we got here. I'm just gonna read from the book. Um, so this is a scene, um, how much time do I got, by the way? I got 10 minutes? Okay, I think I got enough time for that. Um, so this is a scene in the book um, where Mabel, the character who's based in Minneapolis, is like home late at night kind of reminiscing about stuff. And you know how like when you're a teenager or a grown person, if you're me, um, you're like up late at night and you're just like, oh my God, my feelings, my feelings, my thoughts, uh, the world, why the world? You know, so like this is that teenage space. Um, and so anyway, she's thinking about this uh, concert that she went to with her parents. And mind you, y'all can imagine Minneapolis because this book takes place in Minneapolis. And um, she's at the club that her parents took her to see her favorite group, Black Lovers. And um, she like meets up with this, not meets up, but she runs into this cute girl on the dance floor and has this moment, situationship. Um, so here it goes. I'm not gonna lie, I was feeling super awkward because I didn't even know if I knew how to dance at first. But then this girl next to me out of nowhere starts to groove with me. I still remember what she got on. She was so magically pretty. She was looking all witchy with a lavender colored afro and white boots and a necklace of mandarin colored flowers. I started dancing back before I could even think about it. She was real smooth with her movements, twirling around me and dropping it low like bow. I was like, damn. <laughs> I did a helpless version of my dad's two-step and to my surprise, she seemed impressed. She soul clapped at me even, like I was killing it. She smiled and I just kept doing my thing, grinning back at her. And I don't know why I still remember this, but she smelled good too. Like cocoa butter, jasmine, flowers, and a little alcohol on her breath. Even though there was an ex on her hand like me. All of a sudden, a crew of her friends came back with drinks, and she smiled at me and then floated away among them, and I got pushed further back. It made me feel a little disappointed, but I get it. Those were her homies. But for some silly reason, I had wished we could have danced all night together to black lovers, and I could have maybe even known something about her. Next thing I know, I hear a familiar voice. Mabel, they is so fresh. I had to get on this dance floor and do my thing, baby. And there was my mama behind me, shimmying an old lady twerking her heart out to the music. <laughs> we played black lovers on the ride home and I was still buzzing from their weirdness and freeness and blackness. I tried to relive all I saw on the stage that night. The bass player, Black Rose, who is tall and dark with a pretty smile and a pink fade and his jumping up and dancing all over the stage. Black Dahlia, the drummer from Senegal, raised in New Orleans moving every style of rhythm from congas, wind chimes to her drum kit to a djembe. The keys player, Black Iris, with her pretty periwinkle dreads and her big, fine, fat butt, wearing a mint green wedding dress, her eyes closing to the rhythms on her beat machine. And of course, my favorite, Queen Asantewa, and their emotional voice. She a butch, right? My dad said from the front seat, promptly killing my vibe. She could sing her ass off. That falsetto was a young prince in his hay. Ooh, and she played real good too, like Jimmy on that guitar. I'm glad we went, ladies. The way he said she and her really annoyed me, like he knew them or understood something about them because of how they rocked their hair or clothes. Why can't you just enjoy the music, Dad? Why the first thing you wonder about them is if they butch and they don't go by she? I blurted out, feeling heat in my face. Then both me and my dad got quiet. Saquon, the singer Queen of Santua goes by they, baby, my mama said. But she didn't stop there. 
And ooh, that little cutie queen is a fine little tenderoni. I can see why all y'all kids be acting wild behind them, she said, revealing cougar feelings about Queen Asante well, that nobody was wondering about. <laughs> right, they, not she, my bad. He looked at me in the rear view mirror, but I don't think he noticed me rolling my eyes. They used to call him Butch or Stud back in the day. I wasn't trying to be mean. I ain't know. I, I did enjoy the show, though. I said that. I liked it. I just kept rolling my eyes at his fumbling. Whatever. There are still butches or studs, but there are they and thems and more, too. Mom put her hand on dads. This indigo generation is next level. It took me a while to pick up on it, but I get it better now. I know you wasn't trying to be insensitive, Quan, but just be mindful, okay, honey? They go by them and they. After my mom broke it down in her own way, my dad and I both stayed quiet the rest of the drive. I felt like I wanted to cry for some reason, and a couple tears came down, and I wiped them slow so no one would notice, and I feel even more dumb since I was grateful I got to go. My mom turned up the volume, and as Queen's voice filled up the car, I looked at our city glitter by. Even though we still close, my dad gets weird around me in certain ways that make me awkward. I don't know how he would feel if he knew I liked girls because he was kind of too geeked when I got my little boyfriend, as my mom put it when I first started chilling with Terrell. I'm pretty sure my mom wouldn't care since she's always had lesbian and gay friends. I think my dad will feel some type of way about it, like a little disappointed or confused, to be honest. I don't feel in no rush to talk to them about my feelings because, nah, that's that. <laughs> Thank y'all, thank y'all. Um, I have some copies for sale if y'all interested. Um, so yeah, so uh, in writing this book, um, like I shared, like pleasure was an important place to ground is like how do these girls navigate that? Um, astrology is a big part of this book. Um, I think like for me as a spiritual being, as a young person that didn't feel like I fit into religious spaces. Um, I think like astrology and kind of witchy thoughts and feelings really spoke to me, which is a big part of this book. Um, and yeah, I feel like um, there's an aspect of Whitney Houston. Do y'all know about Whitney Houston being queer and bisexual? Somebody, anybody, a couple of y'all. So that's a big theme in this book because I really thought about as a young person in figuring myself, particularly as a black girl who like most people on the planet was obsessed with Whitney Houston. Um, this book, this character's uh, reflect on her and her queerness. Um, the character who I read from uh, discovers in her own research about Whitney Houston and her best friend, who was also her girlfriend when she was younger. Um, so yeah, I think like a lot of aspects of the book, there's a queer grandma in the book who's a very important figure, uh, wants to give permission for young people in this day of age to really know that there's so much that they are teaching us and bringing into the future, but that there's also so much that um, as long as we kind of remember and dream and reclaim these stories, we could remember things that maybe we didn't even know officially, but feel within our bones comes through us, through our ancestors and um, yeah, like that we can continue to live in our dreams. So yeah. I feel like, how much time do I got? Yeah, I got like one, yeah. So y'all can holler at me about any questions y'all have about my book. I know we're gonna do a wonderful Q&A with um, these young folks. And I'm excited um, to get to be on the stage with y'all, especially because this book in a lot of ways is for the generation of young people and is inspired by that. So I'm glad to get to share the stage with y'all. So thank you, Ed Talks.